Welcome to the Unpacking It podcast. I am thrilled to welcome back a, a former guest here on the show. You, you know him from his work on ESPN, TV, radio. You see him everywhere. He's Matt Schick. Matt, great to be with you. How are you? Good to be on with you again, Bryce. It's been uh, it's been a while. It's been too long. Thanks for having me on. Good to see you and your and your jerseys and uh, your great studio setup. I don't know how you got all that stuff. I could use it. I've got great plain painted walls behind me. I've got a huge studio microphone arm that you can see and a door with a dog trying to get out of the room. This is really what I can afford right now. I love it. No, it lo looks great. Sounds great. And I know that you're you're feeling great because you just got back from vacation. So how did it turn out? Now, four kids, age five to 10, what's what's vacation like for you? Yeah, I mean, it, it's vacation and it's also some work. There's no doubt about it. Um, you're just trying to make sure the kids are uh, getting along and alive at the end of each day. That's really those are the two things. They're, they're fed, they're well fed, and uh, just eliminate any variables that could lead to some sort of complaining but it was good we were in hilton head for a week uh rented a house rented some bikes we were i mean it was a test for them we had to it wasn't just going to the beach it was biking to the beach and Ooh. and so there was you know you get now credit to the five-year-old all he had to do was sit in a cart and as i biked him so i was getting the biggest workout nice. and i started empathizing with my father when he got a tandem bike years ago when i was i mean i was probably only 23 at the time <laughs> but uh, we got the tandem bike and he's pulling me in this bike and i didn't uh, have to do much work because he never had he never looked back to see what i was doing so i understood and immediately empathized with him that uh he was he was working out to get me where i needed to go Oh, uh, that's hilarious. I think uh, about growing up, my, my dad, he had like a little, like a seat just on the back of his bike seat. Like thinking about it, it seems really dangerous. So it sounds like we've moved past that then. It is still an option though. The seat on the back is still an option. Is and there really? were a few of those there that you're just hoping you've buckled them because if all of a <laughs> sudden the bike starts feeling very light as you're pedaling, it's like lifting up a very an empty suitcase that you think is full. You're like, well, for a split second, you think you're the strongest person alive. Then you oh. realize there's a reason for that. There's no child in the back anymore. So yeah, the cart is much better. They sit back. They're they're just, I mean, it's got a it's got a foot massager, it's got a spritzer, it's got TV. <laughs> no, it doesn't have all that, but it might as well. That's kind of where we're at here with kids in 2021. I love it. That's awesome. So I am on baby watch right now. My wife is due basically any day now. So uh so we're going from one to two. So you're at four now. Do, do you remember back when, when you, you made that transition from one to two and, and any wisdom you can share with me today? Yeah, I mean, you, you certainly hear the jokes about man-to-man -man defense and all that stuff. I mean, you've, you've heard all of those, and then you get to three and four, and it's zone, and it's all those uh, types of things. But it's, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of from one to two was definitely, well, how old is the oldest? Two. Okay, yeah, our That's oldest cute. was uh, about four months shy, three months shy of two when we had our second. So, yeah, you're kind of in that same that same ballpark um it's just i guess the biggest advice i would have is just survive the first two weeks yep. it's boot camp um do what you, do what you can and make sure bryce i mean this is really the important thing uh make sure that your wife is making you comfortable <laughs> make sure that you've got what you need because it's uh you know there's a lot of responsibility for the father and That's and right. you know this there's a lot of you know waking up in the middle of the night feeding the child all of those things where she gets to sleep so you want to make sure that you're in a good frame of mind mental health is very important so if you could just i would just encourage her to help encourage you and i think yeah. it'll be you know great yeah. shape that that'll go over real well. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Gosh. Well, yeah, it's survive in advance. So that's that's the key. That's it. So that's what I'm hearing. Survive in advance. Uh, no, we're excited. Looking looking forward to it. Well, also fired up, of course, with, with football starting up, college pro. You're you're focused on on the college game. And this has been the wildest summer that I can remember for college football because we're all kind of sitting here going, wait, what what what's what's the direction? Where are we going with college football? What what does it all mean? 
So, so what was the maybe the the, the one story that that had you most nervous in regards to you know, name, image, likeness, the the conference realignment, the potential for a future larger playoff, and and maybe which one has you most I- excited? Oh, the excited one was the the college football playoff expansion because I yeah. think they checked all of the boxes that they needed to check with that, which is improving access because we all know that you know, before the season even begins, half of the FBS is eliminated from playoff contention because of conference affiliation history and uh, recruiting and, and all those types of things, things that are really out of their control geographically and, and conference affiliation. So that half of the FBS eliminated in August – the other half is eliminated by you know the first week of October, and then by the time you get to November, you're talking about eight teams. So I think the fact that the conversation will expand to roughly, I think, 30 teams by mid-November, even the end of November, and you go into championship, conference championship weekend, when we get there, uh, everyone who's in a conference championship game, most of them, especially in the Power Five, will have a shot at making the playoff, and that's good. I, I think... When you step on the field and you win a game or you win a conference championship, you want to know what you've earned, not, well, well, I guess we'll go and see what these 13 people think about what we just did. No, it it needs to be more objective than subjective. So that's what got me excited, although I think we're going to have to wait a little bit longer for that because of the thing that has me most concerned, which is the conference realignment, what the SEC did with Texas and Oklahoma. And I don't fault either side for that. Um, and, and might we have to wait till 2025 for that to be official? I'm not really sure, but we know that it's going to happen. It's smart for the SEC to include those two programs. It's smart for them to follow the money, and that's what college sports is. And so I think that's what the biggest concern is. Not that these decisions were made, but that it's just becoming so transparent that it is professional sports. And that's what college sports now is. Name, image, and likeness is a part of that, which I think is good. Um, but you know, I I worry about college campuses that aren't part of the elite that do need a Texas and Oklahoma to be a part of the conference, so that that money can filter down. And I'm as capitalist as they come, but I, I certainly struggle to uh, to recognize the fact that. Hey, it's survival of the fittest in a lot of ways. And that's that's really too bad because I think there will be a trickle down effect in college football. These these college campuses uh, identify the these campuses are what keep these small college towns afloat. They're, they're the identity of that. You start taking away money from those campuses. It trickles down to the city and student athletes and all those things. So I think the the law of the unintended consequences are going to be something that we may not know for 10 to 15 years, but I'm a little concerned about where college athletics is headed and where it's been headed. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm fascinated by that as well. The unintended consequences fr- from all of these things. And, and so for me, selfishly, I'm a, I'm an app state grad. And, and so specifically for teams like that, that, you know, have made the jump or, you know, teams like Marshall and Boise State and, and teams that really have become consistent college football programs that, you know, crack the top 25 and, and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Where do you see those types of schools play out? Now, to me, those teams are different than teams like Vanderbilt or Kentucky mm-hmm. or teams in bigger conferences that are you know lower on the, on the in the standings, I guess. Yeah, I, th- I think of those kind of programs like in the MAC, um, even the Sun Belt, and those that th- that need, and, and the FCS programs that need those non-conference games with those major conference teams to keep their athletic departments afloat and to help to fund university projects and infrastructure. All of that helps. You take one of those games away. And you're taking a million dollars in a lot of ways, between half a million and a million, sometimes a million and a half dollars away from some of these smaller schools, which is an entire academic budget or an entire athletic budget for a calendar year that helps fund so many different things. And so removing that to me is very um, scary. I don't I, I think those schools will still be OK simply because we're not taking away the number of games in the regular season. I know there's some talk about that. Well, we're expanding this playoff. You need to take a game away. No administrators turning down free money. No. That's what they view it as. And they, they didn't ask the student athletes when they a- added from 11 to 12 about 15, <laughs> 20 years ago. They're not going to ask them, 
hey, what do you think about adding another playoff game and and extending the season that way? So I think you're still going to have those hole, holes to fill. The the problem comes when maybe conferences come up with scheduling agreements, and now there's really on, only one hole on their schedule to fill uh, for one of those lesser uh, conference teams. That that's where you get a little bit concerned. And yeah, to, the App State, you know, making that move. Where are they going to look 10 to 15 years from now in the rearview mirror and go, you know what? We can't win national titles, but we sir, we get to go to a bowl every year. Well, when, what does that mean moving forward? What does the bowl system mean moving forward? Those are really questions that uh, people that get paid a lot more than me are going to have to reckon with. That's right. A lot, of, a lot of your bosses figuring that out. A lot of yeah. those, those ESPN games for sure. Well, I, I guess I'm, we're a ministry for sports fans, so I'm always thinking about it from the the fan perspective. And so when you're doing your your show on you know the Big Ten this morning on Sirius XM, Big Ten Radio, and you know you're you're talking to college football fans and and all that sort of thing. With all these changes, do do you find there is more kind of energy and excitement? Uh, about college football or or do you see things bubbling up where diehard college football fans are going I don't like this direction and and even people leave like I'm I'm done I'm done with college football has it gotten to that point yet what would get us to that point what's kind of your your pulse on on all of that I think because of the pandemic we're just eager to get going so I don't think we're there yet but I can see it headed to a place where you know, for instance, the SEC continues to win these uh, championships and, and competing for it. And this population drift is what it is. I mean, the people are moving south. That's not changing. It's not like the NFL where you finish poorly and you get a number one pick and that helps with parity. You finished last one year, you can win the division the next year. That's not how college sports works. So I, I think people will still be interested in the games and still go to the games. It's about the casual fan that, you, that you're always worried about. Those are the fans that you need to capture. And so when, like us at ESPN or any other company, when you have Texas and Oklahoma entering the SEC in a few years, wherever that may be, you become even more SEC-focused. How do you, even though those are where the best teams are, year in and year out, where most of the talent lies and the population lies for college football and those who care the most about it, how do you continue to make sure the Midwest is included, that the Pac-12 and out West is included in your conversations that have to do with sports? You can't keep talking about Alabama and, and Florida all the time and Auburn and Clemson and, and Oklahoma and Texas. You know, you, you have to include others in your conversation. And ESPN, we drive some of that narrative. So I think that's going to be a challenge moving forward is how do we do that? That's where I think the expansion of the college football playoff comes in, which the sooner that gets here, the better. That's going to force us to, to open up and broaden the conversation and discussion a little bit and include more teams because that is what – that is what is healthy for the sport. Expanding the playoff has never necessarily been about crowning a different champion. It's about making it more inclusive instead of exclusive so that a sport that's becoming more and more regionalized but can become a true national sport again. Because I think there is a danger of people checking out, um, especially midway through the season, if their team doesn't have a chance. That's right. No, that makes a ton of sense. That's a good perspective. And yeah, I'm with you. I can't wait for this college football playoff to actually come together and, and happen the, the sooner the better for sure well all right so we're talking uh sports here on the show and and talking you know college sports but what's better than youth sports so <laughs> so you were you were coaching uh your kids this this spring and summer so what what sports were those and 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 what was your kind of coaching strategy approach and experience like it was Really good. Uh, one of the, I guess it was, there were a few benefits of COVID, uh, but one of them was being able to be home more often, uh, not traveling as much. I used to never be able to coach. I used to watch my kids' games on FaceTime and oh, whatever. Man. And my wife, Kelly, uh, she would be at the park and I'd say, hey, I'd get the FaceTime call from my hotel in, in Connecticut. And they'd, she'd say, hey, uh, Cohen's up now. And so I'd watch and see how he'd do. And it, there's nothing worse than watching your kid through a screen. Um, and so that allowed me this past the last 12 months, allowed me to say, you know what, I'll coach because I think I'll be home a little bit more often. So we have four kids. Um, they are 10. Uh, boys are 10, uh, 7, and 5. Girl is 9. And... We encouraged our five-year-old. He, he just turned six, actually, 
this week on August 2nd, we encouraged him to not play the coach pitch baseball uh, this year just for selfishly so that we could not miss all of the games because oh, nice. someone's got to transport the kids. So he was our sacrificial lamb uh, <laughs> for this baseball season. But I got to coach uh, my 10-year-old in his kid pitch league and in the machine pitch league with my seven-year-old. And then I, uh, and then I got to assistant and kind of volunteer coach with my daughter in softball and she used to play baseball as well. So it was really cool to see. And I will say that our, our seven-year-old, I was the head coach of that team. And it was the first time really being the head coach. Mm. And I'd been an assistant for a long time. And so you're, you know, you're doing practice schedules and trying to make kids happy and just, and then you realize, like, you care a heck of a lot more about this than these kids do, <laughs> right? Like, we got to the championship. Oh, we wow. lost that championship. The kids are goofing off afterwards. And I probably didn't sleep for a week because I kept thinking about, man, if I would have just put uh, Aiden in this goodness. spot or I would have, man, if I would have just said, hey, hit a ground ball, don't hit into this double play, we could have won. Like these kids don't care. It's pool time, man, and they all got a runner-up trophy. And so oh, they love they, it. They didn't care. They can't read. They all can't read. They don't see, see that it says championship, runner-up, whatever. It's it's a five-dollar <laughs> trophy. They're swimming in it. They're loving it. So I think you know oh, great. I, it was interesting because it does teach you about you see how a lot of different parents act, oh, right? yeah. and how they react. Character isn't about how you act. It's revealed in how you react to situations. What's your knee-jerk impulse? response to a certain outcome or instant and it took a lot of restraint to not pipe up and say something i'll calm down people like just relax this is these are kids are seven and eight a parent chirping at me and me trying to just def i was the diffuser right wow. like my wife's into essential oils she's got diffusers all over the house <laughs> i am the diffuser at ball games as a coach where i'm i'm trying to be cordial to the other coaches and make sure that you know yeah, we all want to win, but there's seven and eight. Let's just have a good time. And um, so I think that was a real revelatory. And at the end of the championship game, and, you know, we're applauding the other team. And one of the other coaches came up to me uh, on the other team and said, he goes, man, I've watched you coach this year. He goes, you have the patience of Job, man. Wow. He goes, and, and, and it's and to hear that be said mm. when you're hurting cats most of the time. <laughs> And you're watching, you know, your son make a play here, make an error here and trying to coach and make all these kids happy. But at the same time, coach them and be firm, but not take it as life or death. And to hear another coach say that, I said, OK, we're trying to be an example out there. You're trying to use this as not just a, a volunteer job, but as a, maybe a ministry opportunity yeah. to show that, OK, there's something different about this person mm -hmm. and this coach. And, and he was a fellow Christian as well. And that that was reaffirming that, okay, I guess we're doing okay. The outcome, the eternal outcome has been decided. Let's just make sure we're not making this, you know, <laughs> this outcome of this game between seven and eight year olds, the end all be all. Cause it's not. Oh, that's a tremendous approach. And, and I love that too, because oftentimes when, you know, people coach and you, you view it as an opportunity to reach the kids, impact the kids, be a leader and, and a mentor potentially to, to the kids. The impact can can be on the crowd. It can be on the on those parents, and and so there's there's tons of opportunity there. So I I, I appreciate that uh, kind of mentality on that. So um, I don't know when you got into it, what your what your thought was when you said, "Hey, I'll be the the head coach." How different was it from what you expected the the season to be like to kind of what it what it ended up being? Yeah, it was. Um, I didn't think I would care as much as I did. Like you try to just guard your heart about it, whether it's outcomes or with each given play and come on, get the ball in. And because when the opposing coach or opposing parents raise the level to a nine or 10 because of their emotion, you have to fight every fiber of your being to not reach that same level. All it takes is one or two people. You've seen it at sporting events with kids. And as your kids get older, you'll see like, the parents can really make the season or ruin the season. Yep. It's not necessarily about the kids. Mm -hmm. You know, you might have a kid or two here that misbehaves or is kind of a jerk or whatever. It doesn't have good body language, no matter what age, whether they're seven or 15, that happens. But a lot of the times the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree <laughs> and you can see, okay, I can see his behaviors because of that person. I'm kind of connecting dots here. 
And so I just wish, I, I think I come away with it with, it's awesome to care about how well your kid does, but also to maintain the perspective that there are so many more important things than whether or not that run scored from third or not, or whether or not that ump called that play out at first. And uh, th- that was a that was a challenge, and it only and it gets worse, right? Like these are six, seven, eight years old, and you get parents going back and forth in this, and you just sit back and go, "Okay, I'm kind of kind of connecting dots about what's going on in, in society here and social media, and why we're all fighting because, hey, we just want to have a good time, right? No, not not all of us. Some of us really want to win. No, it's it's great to hear, and I I hope to coach one day. So that'd be that'd be fun. I used to coach swim team, so that was I I had kids <laughs> age six to eighteen, and all the parents in between. So that was always an adventure too. But um, but that's good. Uh, that's good. Good stuff. On the good on, thing about the swimming though yeah. is like when they're underwater, you they can't really hear you, right? So especially in the breaststroke, it's you got to oh, yeah. time your yells. Time it right. That's right? it. Exactly. Oh man. I'll never forget this one dad. He would run up and down the sideline. Go Amanda, go, go Amanda, go the whole time, the whole <laughs> up and down. It was great. Um, so, so the last time we, we talked, it was kind of right as the pandemic began, it was about in, in April. And so we were still trying to figure everything out. And so I'm curious for you, just as you look at this, this last year, and in many ways things are, are continuing, but but I know for me, it's there, there have been so many challenges and ways that I've I've grown in my faith and seen God move, and and, and areas I'm struggling in, and, and trying to figure things out. And um, you know, the pandemic's part of it. Life, just in general, is part of that as well. But but for you, what are some things that maybe have 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 bubbled up? Some some things you've been studying, learning, experiencing uh, that that you can share and maybe be an encouragement to to some of our listeners today. Yeah, I think um, you know, at the beginning of this calendar year. Uh, I've got a couple of pastor friends who I met uh, through Campus Crusade back in the day. That's how I met my wife, actually, 21 years ago in San Diego on a summer project. She was at St. Cloud State. I was at the University of Colorado, and we were one of two of 95 college kids from all over the country gathered in San Diego for uh, nine weeks. And we met a few years later, got married. And um, and and what you learn is about treating your job as a ministry opportunity, treating uh, every interaction you have uh, as something that could have an eternal consequence or eternal purpose. And I I think the biggest challenge for me is, um, and and has been and continues to be, is when you have such a visual medium, um, you sometimes judge yourself on, you know, what you judge your status on what either shows you're doing or what games you're calling or what um, what you're being asked to do or, frankly, sometimes not asked to do. Mm-hmm. And that is where sometimes you find your your legacy, right? I want my legacy to be this. Or when I'm, when I'm dead, I want people to think about me as this. And I left my mark here. And, and I think what you come to realize is that you know, even the most famous broadcaster, when they if they die, as soon as they die, will grieve, um, get a hashtag going, and then after a couple of weeks, they'll be forgotten. Mm. Uh, but the lasting impact and legacy that you truly have is with those that are immediately around you. And so, going back to the last twelve months and getting into coaching and just creating memories for for my kids, and you know, like I've been reading uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, getting back to the reason that I brought up where I met my wife is that two of the guys that were on that project became a few of them became pastors. And one of them sent me a, Hey, here's a Bible in 365 days and and how to get through it because I've never read every single chapter and every single verse. And because where do I go? Do I start here? Do I start there? And so uh, he sent me this thing that allows you to chart it out and kind of complimentary versus here, a chapter here, things that go together in the old and the new. And so I've been doing that since December and I guess we're in July. So I'm halfway through it and I'm kind of halfway through the Psalms as well. And one of the Psalms talks about with David about, and this is, this is a guy who is after God's own heart, right? He was a, a favored son, but he could do a lot wrong. And one of the things that he talked about was like in Psalm 86, he's, he prays, give me an undivided heart, Ooh. an undivided heart. And when you have four kids, a wife, a job, 
activities, transporting them from game to game, making sure they're fed, going on vacation, do all this. How do you get an undivided heart? Mm. And that is something that is really hard to do and something only God can do. And so that, I would say that's something that I am continually praying about mm. and striving for is getting an undivided heart, meaning start, start in the most important part, um, God, his word, prayer, praise, all of those things, and let that spill out. We talked about the trickle down effect with college football and, and all those things. Let that be the trickle down to right. every other aspect of your life. Cause so many things are pulling at you for attention, whether it's your need to have attention uh, at work or from viewers or listeners or how many clicks you have, how many likes you're getting on this tweet or retweets or Facebook posts, engagement, all of those things. When in reality, start with engaging with God and let everything spill out from that um, and not worry as much uh, about those things. Because, you know, when it's all said and done, the legacy you leave is going to be with those immediately impacted by your existence, which are those you wake up with and interact with um, closely on a daily basis, not necessarily those that watch you from afar. And so those are things that that I continually try and, and think about and, and pray about to keep a level head. Because in, in this business, you can really get lost in the need for praise, adoration, attention, mm. and, and all those things that go along with it when the reality is that is not important and that has not the the legacy that that truly matters. Man, no, that's that's strong. And and so uh going back to the 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 Bible reading, um yeah, what what has that experience uh, been like? Because I know guys listening, they probably can relate to that to say, hey, I've never read through the whole Bible. I'm going through it in a kind of a different way. I'm I got about two months left, but um, but but what what has it kind of that discipline of it and kind of reading it in a in a different way than it sounds like the way that you've read it in the past, where you you know take a chapter here or there and and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's um, it it really helps understand certain context like you know when david is going through his life or death experiences with saul and running for his life then it takes you to the psalm here's what he was writing during that time here's what was on his heart during that time um here's what was written in first samuel and here's the same thing in first chronicles or second samuel like those things that are written at different times but have similar messages where we talk about the gospels being um you know the, the the four gospels written at different times and and they have similar messages uh, and sometimes identical messages the same is true in the old testament which i wasn't necessarily uh, aware of as much as this is helping me get through that like for instance you'll it'll say uh, like on the schedule that i'm looking at here it'll say hey th today you're going to read uh, Second Samuel 19 through 21, and tomorrow you're going to read these four psalms. You're like, well, why would it take me there? Well, it's because those were either written at the same time or have a similar similar message. Sometimes it takes you through the New Testament, sometimes through the Old Testament. I think one of the biggest challenges is when you say, hey, I want to read the Bible. Okay, then you open it up. Sometimes you do it aimlessly. Mm. I'm the kind of person that needs some direction. Yeah. Uh, but you'll open it and you'll read, okay, do I read a couple of chapters here? What did I learn? But when you can bounce a little back and forth, because no disrespect to the Old Testament, there's some real grinding that happens. It's like two days in football. Where you're reading <laughs> going, what did I just read here? And how is it relevant today? Yeah. When you can complement that with something in the New Testament, I think that's really advantageous. So, yeah, this thing has been really good. And I guess this week it's going to take me through the Psalms and First Kings. I'll bounce in the Proverbs and get back to the New Testament soon. So, yeah, I, I need... I need itineraries. I need rundowns, right? I need to, right. you need to tell me what we're talking about on the show uh, and how we're timed out and then I can prepare for it. So it's good. Oh, that's awesome. No, I, I love it. And, and even as you're, you mentioned, as you're kind of alluding to the, the idea of performance as, you know, as a broadcaster and there is an element to that. Um, and I can, you know, just relate to a lot of what, what you're saying. Um, but, but how does that compare even to viewing Bible reading as a performance too, where you get caught up and you, that's your mindset where it is a little bit more of a to-do check off versus experiencing God, enjoying that. 
And then even with, yeah. you know, with, with broadcasting, uh, maybe similar parallel there. That I don't know if you can connect that at all. Well, it's uh, you, you don't want it to be like broadcasting. It's your job, but you also have to find joy in it. Mm. Can't just be something that, okay, I clocked in, I clocked out, I'm paying the bills. There, there needs to be some sort of joy in it. Sometimes you can find that joy by doing it for God, honoring God in the way that you do your job. And that can be help you do that as a ministry opportunity. That has been a challenge with, as you read through God's word, you don't want it to be, you want it to be a delight rather than a duty, right? Like checking it off saying, okay, I, I did this. Now I'll pray for a minute. All right, now I'll check Twitter. All right. That, that, that can be a, that can be a stumbling block as well. And so, yeah, I'm with you a hundred percent that, um, you don't want it to be necessarily become your religion of here's my here's my way of getting to God. Try and view it as this is how God is reaching me. And, you know, remember, God plus whatever is unnecessary. Jesus plus there's no plus there. You shouldn't feel obligated. It should come from the joy of the grace and mercy that we receive on a daily basis that you do that. And so I think it perhaps helping others and myself get into the mindset of reflecting on God's gifts before even diving into the word so that it doesn't feel as much of a, a duty and obligation as a job, as much as it is just a natural response to the grace that, that you're given, um, that you truly don't deserve, which is what grace is. Amen. Amen. No, that's awesome. And yeah, just preparing our hearts to before diving in so that yeah. then, yeah, we do have that that right perspective and and right heart uh, perspective. So, yeah, good stuff from from Matt Schick here on unpacking it. And and man, it's always always great having you on the show and, and appreciate your insight and encouragement. It's been very uh, encouraging to me, and I know it, it is to our listeners as well. And, and so, I guess uh, final thought: Is there a college football team you're you're most intrigued by, or a storyline that you're most intrigued by? We're sitting here at the beginning of August. Uh, heading into the, the the 2021 season. Yeah, I think there's a, a couple. One is just the conference realignment aspect of this. Who's going to be moving and shaking? Who's going to be attempting to pluck a team from another league? I'm a Colorado Buffalo alumni. What does Where do they go? Do they stay in the Pac-12? What does the Big Ten do? Do they try and get Kansas? Or does, do people just stand pat now and see see how that all plays out? So I'm I'm intrigued by that. In terms of specific teams, I'm intrigued by North Carolina. Mm. Uh, there, there are a lot of national pundits expecting huge things from North Carolina. I, I just wonder if they're a little out over the skis with a, an over under of ten wins, right? Like that's that's a lot of wins. But you look at their schedule and you go, you know what? It's hard to see a lot of losses there with with Sam Howell. Yeah, you lose uh, Deami Brown, a couple good, really good running backs, but Mac Brown has recruited to a level where, especially in the trenches. You get those number four, number five star guys, and you put enough of those recruiting classes together, especially up front, you get to be able to compete a little bit uh, with a Clemson who they might see at season's end. And so I think North Carolina is intriguing. I think Iowa State is another team that returns back a lot of folks. Uh, NFL pick at quarterback, NFL pick at running back, NFL pick at tight end that all decided to come back and could give, you know, could have a nice little revenge tour for Oklahoma and Texas this That's year, right. revenge for leaving eventually the Big 12. So that whole dynamic with the Big 12 and how Oklahoma and Texas are treated and maybe oh. what Iowa State can do this year, I think that's a that's an intriguing, uh, an intriguing storyline. Yeah, big time. Oh yeah, the fans in the stadiums this year. That's gonna be that's gonna be fun to see. Just to, to have them return, and then specifically in the Big Twelve. Gosh, yeah, that'd be wild. Well, Matt, man, really appreciate you you being a part of the show and enjoy the the upcoming season. And we can, we can find you on Sunday morning, ESPN Radio, ten to one. Uh, also, College Game Day, ESPN Radio on Saturdays during the fall. And, and then you're the, the co-host on, on Big Ten this morning, Sirius XM, Big Ten Radio, Channel 372, Monday through Friday. So uh, keep up the great work, Matt. Always love having you on and, and, and love seeing you on, uh, on ESPN and hearing you as well. So thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Bryce. God bless. Always good to be on with you, man. Anytime. All right. I appreciate it. There's Matt Schick joining us here on the Unpacking It podcast. Uh -huh.